Now the type of frames that I mentioned earlier are actually broadcast, multicast, and unicast, or what we sometimes call point-to-point. -point. Broadcast frames are really easy to identify. They have all Fs in the destination MAC address. And this means that everyone is supposed to listen to them. Examples include ARP requests and DHCP messages. Now multicast addresses are addresses that usually a particular type of node listens to. So for example, the spanning tree 802.3 frame that you saw earlier is a multicast frame and switches pay attention to those. You can also join a multicast group and that's what IGMP and PIM are all about. So if you send out an IGMP request you can join a multicast group and pay attention to a particular multicast frame. All nodes have unicast MAC addresses and they begin with 00. zero. All source MAC addresses in Ethernet frames will be unicast. Here we have our three examples of the broadcast, unicast, and multicast frames. Starting at the top we've got our unicast frame and you can see that both the source and the destination MAC addresses begin with 00. zero. Moving on down we have the broadcast frame. Again, the source MAC begins with 00, zero but in the destination we see all Fs, 6 bytes all Fs. And the last one at the bottom, 00, zero in the source MAC beginning and then 0, 01 in the destination. This indicates that this is a multicast frame. Well, now that we understand a little bit about the physical layer and we understand the structure of an Ethernet frame, how does Ethernet as a protocol operate? Ethernet was built on a bus topology, meaning that all the nodes were fighting for or contending for bandwidth. So they had to have a basic method for accessing or taking turns getting a hold of the network. So that's what the access method is all about. CSMA CD or carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. And the basic idea is that a node listens first on its receive lines and if there's nothing happening then it goes ahead and transmits a frame. But it may be that other nodes transmit at the same time and this causes a collision on everyone's receive lines. Nodes involved in a collision essentially back off and then try it again later. Now we detect a collision by an increased power or voltage level. But as soon as switches were introduced into the network instead of hubs, collisions were drastically reduced if not eliminated entirely. This diagram just shows a little bit about what happens when a collision occurs on the network. Nodes A and D both have listened to the network and determined that it was clear and at the same time or about the same time they both try and transmit. Somewhere in between a collision occurs. All nodes hear the collision due to that increased voltage or power but A and D, because they've obeyed the minimum frame size rules, know that it was their frame that was involved in the collision. So these nodes issue a jam signal. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the jam signal along with some other times uh, later on, but this is essentially what happens. The collision occurs and then propagates out. Here are some of the Ethernet rules. The minimum frame size is 64 bytes and this follows along with our 46 byte minimum payload. Add the headers and there we have it. Now 64 bytes converted to bits gives us 512. If we multiply that times the time that it takes for a single bit to be transmitted we get about 51.2 microseconds and we actually call this the slot time. More on that later. The maximum frame size is 1526. Again, that's the maximum data field size plus some of the headers. Now the 345 rule and the 12 rule, those are there when you have a shared media or we're back to that half duplex bus topology and this describes the number of hubs, populated segments, and the overall distance of the network. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we don't like to use hubs in Ethernet networks anymore. So these rules have kind of gone by the wayside. The last thing on our list is 100 meters and that describes the maximum distance that a particular Ethernet node is supposed to be away from the switch. That includes patch cables.
Most protocols have some timers or times that we need to be aware of, and Ethernet is no different. Slot time is the first up on our list, and it is that 51.2 microseconds we talked about earlier. This refers to the minimum amount of time that an Ethernet node should be transmitting in order to detect any and all collisions that may have involved its transmission or frame. Now this ensures that we can detect whether or not our transmission made it. Ethernet does not have any acknowledgments and so this becomes important. The interframe gap is the space in between frames. This is the minimum time that a node can wait before transmitting another frame. And what this allows is your neighbors to transmit their frames after you're done. Now you may recall from our earlier diagram that nodes involved in a collision have to stop transmitting and issue the jam signal. In addition, before they can transmit again, they have to back off and wait for a certain amount of time. But how long do they back off and wait for? This is governed by the binary exponential random backoff algorithm, which takes into account the number of times that you've collided, some random number, and the slot time. These are run through the algorithm and you're given this random value. Now nodes will typically back off and wait a certain amount of times before they figure out that there might be a problem on the network. And the number that comes up most often is 16. But remember that all of this collision stuff infers that there is a shared media or a bus. Again, once we have switches in there, this is almost eliminated entirely. Two terms that we can use to help us understand how this network operates are broadcast domain and collision domain. Let's take collision domain first. Collision domain describes how far a collision will actually propagate once it occurs. So those two frames got together, they smashed into each other, and the signal actually propagates away from the point of the collision. Well, hubs will continue to forward collisions. They're not very bright, but bridges and switches, and routers for that matter, that pay attention to MAC addresses will not forward the collisions. A broadcast domain refers to the distance that a broadcast frame will travel before it stops. So, for example, a node issues an ARP request, which is a broadcast frame, all Fs in the destination, and it hits a hub, the hub will continue to forward it. And that's because the hub doesn't really care about MAC addresses. It turns out that a switch or a bridge will also forward this broadcast frame out all ports except the port that it came in on. Now, routers are more concerned with IP addresses, so they will stop a broadcast frame from propagating. That little green light that comes on when you plug into the network is a direct result of the signaling that's going on between the network interface card and the port that you've connected to in the network, whether it's a switch or a router or a hub. Now, TEMBASE-T uses a 16 millisecond pulse to indicate that it is alive and well. And that's where the link comes from. But it also turns out that as we introduce faster network speeds, we have to have a way to negotiate the speed and whether or not we're doing full or half duplex. Fast link pulse signaling does that. It's a code word that is sent in ones and zeros between the network nodes. And using this, they negotiate how fast they're going to talk and what their capabilities are. The last thing that we're going to talk about today is half versus full duplex operation. Half duplex simply means that only one node is talking on the network at a particular time. So you can transmit or receive, but you can't do both. Traditional Ethernet, in our case 10 megabit Ethernet, is a half duplex system. The central node is going to be a hub, and we can have collisions, and nodes have to contend for bandwidth and wait for each other to talk and all that stuff. Central to this is the one pair of wires for receiving and one pair for transmitting. And this is called a bus or a broadcast system. This is not to be confused with broadcast frames. Full duplex means that you can transmit and receive at the same time. Now on a 100 megabit network that would mean that the maximum throughput is going to be 200 megabit. The central node would have to be a switch in that case. And we would say that each node is in its own collision domain. Well, 
That'll about wrap it up for Ethernet today. We've kind of scratched the surface of it, but I hope you have enough to go on, and I hope you enjoyed listening. If you want to read a little more, go ahead and go through the chapter, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this networking podcast. I hope that you found it helpful. I also hope to see you at the next one in the series. If you have comments or questions, you can email me at bruce.hartpence at rit.edu or visit www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destinations.